If you had the right to disconnect from your smartphone, would you use it? Could you use it? Could you switch off your smartphone for a whole day and feel okay about it? Or would you be worried you were missing out on something? Could you take a week-long break from social media or just not respond to after-hours calls or messages from work? If any of those things sound like your worst nightmare, you're not alone. For most people, putting distance between yourself and your smartphone is really hard to do. I love technology. I love it. I use it every day, couldn't do my job without it, and I've even retrofitted my house with as many smart gadgets as I can find. Because technology is great. It has improved our lives in countless ways. And smartphone technology in particular has had a big impact on the way that we live. We can communicate with our friends and family from anywhere in the world. We can do our shopping, our banking. We can check the news. And most importantly, we can always know what our friends are having for lunch. <laughs> but our smartphones do more than just catalogue our best meals. They're now on the forefront of science and healthcare. For example, they can improve the health and safety of entire communities by instantly detecting unsafe levels of air or water pollution. They can help people overcome serious addictions. And they can even help reduce the invasiveness of brain surgery. They're pretty amazing. But for those of us who aren't performing craniotomies, our smartphones are just those handy little supercomputers that we carry around all day and fall asleep beside at night. We love our smartphones a lot. I first started thinking about our relationship with our smartphones after seeing some pretty high-profile examples of where thoughtless, offensive or just plain stupid use of smartphones landed someone in some really hot water. And you might remember these examples. Justine Sacco, who tweeted out an offensive remark as she boarded a flight to South Africa in 2014. At the time, she only had a few dozen followers, but by the time her plane landed 11 hours later, she was trending on Twitter. In 2015, Walter Palmer posted a picture of himself and Zimbabwe's most famous lion, Cecil, who he'd just shot. Both Walter and Justine paid a huge price for what was probably a fairly frivolous decision at the time to post something to social media. And although it was their choice of content to post that got them into trouble, it was ultimately their smartphones that let them follow through with some really bad ideas. Now, most of us won't have anything like that happen in our lives, but it did get me thinking about how the way that we use our smartphone could have an impact on our well-being. So I went looking for information. As an academic, I have access to enormous research databases, but I was surprised to find there wasn't a whole lot of research about how we interact with our smartphones, at least not from the perspective of health or well-being. So I thought, well, I love technology and I'm a health researcher. Why don't I see what I can find? So my team started designing studies aimed at trying to understand how or why some people seem to have more problems with their smartphone use than others. And we started with personality. We found that there are two personality traits that reliably predicted who was more likely to have problems with their smartphones than others. And those traits were conscientiousness and neuroticism. The more neurotic people were, the more likely they would have higher problems with their smartphone use. And we tried to understand this relationship by thinking that, well, perhaps people who are more anxious or worried or fearful might use their smartphones to try to distract themselves from negative thoughts or feelings, kind of like a form of escapism. Or perhaps they seek or find emotional validation online, and these things keep them engaged with their smartphones for longer than they had intended. We also found that people who were lower in conscientiousness were also much more likely to have higher problematic use of their smartphones, but this one wasn't so hard to understand. People who are low in conscientiousness are usually less good at making good choices about their health. So they're much less likely to do things like eat a balanced diet, get regular exercise, or limit their alcohol intake. So it wasn't so hard to see how people who are low in conscientiousness might also struggle to manage healthy screen time limits. So this was a good start. We know that there are characteristics about people that play a role in how we engage with our smartphones but we wanted to know if our smartphone use was having an impact on our well-being. When we drilled down into our data, we found that quite a lot of people did have quite a lot of negative experiences with their smartphones. We found that one in three people felt anxious if they couldn't check their messages, and one in three people said that they'd become less productive because of the time that they were spending on their smartphones. Around 40% of people said that they felt lost if they didn't have their smartphone with them, and over 60% of people said that they usually spend more time on their smartphones than they had intended to. But the question we had was, do people actually feel worse if they use their smartphones more? And the 
answer to that question was yes, they do. Problematic smartphone use predicted less happiness, less sense of autonomy, and decreased relationship satisfaction. We even tracked people's daily mood fluctuations and matched them up with their smartphone activities on the same days. And we found that people's happiness was lowest when they'd been using their smartphones for something that they thought was not a good use of their own time. And this was important because then we were learning that how we feel is related to what we use our smartphones for, not just how long we use our smartphones for. So we were learning a lot about the issues that people were having with their smartphone use, but we had a problem. We couldn't tell if people were sad because they use their smartphones or they use their smartphones because they're sad. So we asked them. We interviewed people and we asked them to tell us how they feel about their smartphones. A really big theme that came out of our interviews was the idea that smartphones are eroding people's downtime. Almost like they couldn't relax and just be. The smartphone was always there, beckoning them to check for messages or show everyone how exciting their life was or just make sure they weren't missing out on something. Disconnecting didn't seem to be an option, but for all the stress that seemed to come with having a smartphone around all the time, the idea of not having it around all the time seemed to feel just as bad. Another really big theme was the impact of smartphones on relationships. Relationships with our partners, with our families, and even with ourselves. A lot of people talked about the benefits of smartphones in helping them stay in contact with the people that they care about. But they also talked about the impact of smartphones, uh, smartphones impacting on the ability to make meaningful connections. They talked about feeling fubbed. That's the sense of feeling snubbed by the presence of somebody else's smartphone and how that just knowing that the person that they were with could switch their attention to their smartphone at any moment was enough to sometimes degrade the quality of that interaction. Almost like there was a phones before friends rule. But something kept bothering me. How do we know that, that problematic smartphone use is a real thing and not just neurotic people being neurotic or sad people using their smartphones to try to feel better? Maybe we're worried about nothing. After all, society has a history of panicking about the latest technologies and their potential effects on the young people who use them. We've been worried about video games, and before that televisions, and before that radios, and before that even books. And none of those things have torn apart the fabric of society. So could problematic smartphone use just be the next iteration of social panic about the latest technology? Well, the answer to that one seems to be no. It's not just the old people worrying about the kids and their computers. We, in, we surveyed adults from age 18 right through to 93, and we found that quite a lot of people really did have quite a lot of concerns about their smartphone use, but it had nothing to do with age. We found that young adults definitely use their smartphones much more than middle-aged or older adults, but they were no less concerned of, about the potential for their smartphone use to have an impact on their well-being. We, we also found that problematic smartphone use was consistently high in adults all the way through to age 40. So the idea or perhaps the stereotype of the older generation worrying about or disapproving of the latest technology didn't seem to hold up. So after a few years of doing this research, I was working on ways to help people manage their screen time and have a healthy tech life balance. But it felt like things were getting a little bit harder at work as well. There seemed to be more emails and more requests for my time and my attention and just more of everything. And things seemed to be taking much longer to get done. I didn't seem to be able to plough through tasks the way I was used to. At first, I would think, I'm just having a bad week. But then I started having bad months. And the workload that I was used to carrying suddenly seemed to feel really, really heavy. And then I started making mistakes. I'm definitely not saying I don't make mistakes. I feel like I spend a lot of time at work fixing my mistakes before anybody else can see them, but these were uncharacteristic mistakes. Things got past me that normally wouldn't have. And then, towards the end of 2019, I made a big mistake. Not catastrophic, nobody died, but it was big enough for me to know that something was definitely wrong, and it was also around this time that my mental health took a nosedive. Without even realising it, I'd been slowly but surely heading straight towards burnout. Burnout is a state of mental, physical and emotional exhaustion, and it can be brought on by things like prolonged stress, lack of self-care, or burning the candle at both ends. And it felt like shutdown, like I had shut down. 
Nothing worked. It was like my brain said, that's it, I'm out of here. I could drag myself into work each day, but then all I could do was stare at my computer or stare at the wall or stare at the floor. And my whole body was tired all of the time and no amount of sleep made any difference. But the worst part for me was the anxiety. I used to love my job, but I didn't want to be at work anymore. And just the idea of checking my emails felt like a fresh trauma every time. I can remember being in my office and staring at the floor and imagining myself just laying down on it, closing my eyes and letting everything that I'd worked for float away. I didn't care anymore and I had nothing left to give. So I took some leave from work and my amazing friends and colleagues helped me to climb out of the hole that I'd fallen into. And when I reflected on the things that I'd been thinking about as I sat at the bottom of the hole, I realised something. I kept having this same thought, a fantasy or a desire to get on a plane and go somewhere, anywhere, with no Wi-Fi. I kept imagining myself on an island or in a jungle and nobody could reach me. There were no emails and no messages. And I realised I just wanted to disconnect. And then I tried to work out how this even happened to me. How did it sneak up on me without me noticing? Looking back, I can tell you I had a pretty terrible work-life balance. I didn't take enough vacations and I probably didn't get enough sleep. But the biggest problem I had is I'd been letting work creep into my downtime for years. But the main way that I'd been letting work creep into my downtime was via my smartphone. I had it with me all the time. It was barely ever out of arm's reach. And using it to check emails or answer student queries had just become the norm no matter what time of day or night it was. I was immersed in my own problematic smartphone research, but oblivious to my own problematic use. The problem was, using my smartphone to answer emails in the evening or check on status of a project on the weekend felt like productivity to me. It felt like I was making the most of my time, and it even felt like I was being a good employee. But the truth was, every time I picked up my smartphone and let work creep into my downtime, I was cheating myself out of the opportunity to disconnect. I didn't get to fully recharge, and eventually, my battery went flat. We all need to remember to disconnect from our smartphones and reconnect with ourselves. I know this from my research, and I know it from my lived experience. But it's hard. We have our whole lives wrapped up in our smartphones now. If I asked you to give up your smartphone for good right now, you'd probably laugh and tell me to get serious. But we need to feel empowered to disconnect. We should be able to leave our smartphones alone for as long as we like and not be questioned or judged or even penalised. The right to disconnect can and should be a social right as much as it can and should be a legal right. We shouldn't feel compelled to always be available, to always be connected. We need a shift in our attitudes towards disconnecting and we need them backed up by laws. France and Italy now have the right to disconnect enshrined in legislation. And giving people the legal and social right to disconnect and empowering people to exercise that right can only lead to happier, healthier people and happier, healthier communities. And we need to start now, as individuals, to change our unhealthy social norms and workplace cultures. I still love technology, despite it leading me towards an unhappy place. But now I make sure that I disconnect so that I can stay connected to the things that really matter to me. And I hope that you can too. Thank you.